Thanks for tuning in to Scotch 101 with myself, Georgie Bell, and Holly Sidewand, my USA counterpart. Usually I'd have a distillery behind me, but COVID, so you'll have to make do with my garden fence. We're about to go into why and how, from grain to glass, whiskey tastes the way it does. And speaking of whiskey, this seminar has been sponsored by Aberfeldy, also known as the Golden Dram. Best sipped neat, or I really enjoy it stirred down with honey, as this brings out the honeyed notes that this Highland distillery is known for. So, without further ado, pour yourself a whiskey, sit back, stay tuned, and I'll see you in New Orleans next year. Cheers. Hi everyone and welcome to our digital tales seminar this year, um, the Tales of the Cocktail 2020. My name is Georgie Bell, I'm the Global Single Malts Ambassador at Bacardi and I'm coming to you live, well maybe not live, this is pre-recorded, but I'm coming to you from my living room in London. So not as sweaty and humid as it usually is in tales and very much missing the camaraderie but stoked that we're able to still get the education element of this over to you um and i am joined by holly thanks georgie uh, my name is holly sidewand i am the north american brand ambassador for bacardi single malt so georgie's counterpart she spends a lot of time with me and um i am coming to you from new york but i am a fake new yorker i'm actually in weehawken new jersey so i get the good view so Excited to be here for Scotch 101 um, with Tales for 2020. Yep, and so as Holly said, we are going to be delivering you your Scotch element of the education with Scotch 101. And I was very lucky I was able to do this seminar a couple of years ago, and it was probably one of my favorites that I've ever done because it really just goes into the basics. And the brilliant thing is, is hopefully you'll come away from this seminar knowing everything about what a bottle of scotch is and how to translate a label and really how to work your back bar properly so that you really know your glens from the other glens different production techniques uh, different maturation techniques the past the present and the future of scotch all in one go so before we kick off and looking at scotch as a whole i kind of want to focus on the world of whiskey because the word whiskey itself is multifaceted. And as you can see within this map, there are now 33 whiskey producing countries and we're growing year on year. In five years time, if you ask that question again, there'll probably be about 40. The word whiskey used to refer to just the big five, as we like to call them, uh, American, Canadian, Irish, Scotch, and Japanese whiskey. Um, but these days it can cover a whole plethora of different whiskeys. Um, however, Scotch can only come from Scotland and it can be the only nation that can be ordered over the bar. You order a Scotch and that's what you get. So we're going to be zoning in on that. But when we, before we do as well, we're going to look at sort of what is whiskey itself. And, you know, uh, whiskey, uh, my whole career has been in whiskey, in Scotch whiskey. And the thing I love about whiskey is that it isn't just one flavor. It's a multi-dimensional flavor, the multi-dimensional spirit. And as you can see on this a definition, is, it's a type of distilled alcoholic beverage made from fermented grain mash. But really it is so much more than that. And there are so many decisions that can be made by yourself as the drinker and by us, when I say us from Bacardi, but the, the producers, the people who are crafting these whiskies. And all of these decisions will then determine the types of flavors that you get in your glass. And so these come from the different grain types that you're using in production, your yeast, your distillation equipment, 
whether you're going to age or, or not. Um, the cask type, country laws and regulations, which we'll definitely be getting into with scotch. Um, your taste preference and your way of drinking as well. And I think because of all of these factors that there are within the world of whiskey, it means that it's a really dynamic, exciting category to be part of. That being said, I realize that there's quite a lot of jargon around the world of whiskey. Um, there's quite a lot of um, stereotypes, maybe stigmas associated with it. Am I right, Holly? Or Yes, there's uh, lots of words that I guess are just expected to be known. <laughs> That's why. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And so what we're going to be doing is breaking these down for you during the next 45 minutes or so. Now, I said that we were going to be focusing on the past, the present and the future. And like any good story, we really need to set it up in the right way. So we're going to be looking at the past, first of all. And I've kind of tried to put the timeline of Scotch whiskey onto a page, just the history of Scotch, just right there. And obviously there is a lot more depth to it, but I don't want this to be too much of a history lesson because I think we're going to get a lot more from it when we come into production and talking about why whiskey tastes the way it does. But I think some of the really exciting things to pull out from this timeline of the history of Scotch whiskey is that a lot of the history is dictated by taxation um, and a lot of it is dictated by law. So, you know, I said here 1494, early distillation appears on tax records, tax records straight away. We know that people were distilling before that, of course, within Scotland, originally calling whiskey Uskabar, um, kind of translating into the water of life, unfortunately, sometimes being called the water of death as well because of the way it was made, unfortunately, not today. Thank goodness. Um, but as we go through the history of Scotch, you'll see that throughout the years, whiskey is really being defined by taxation and by law. And when I pulled up this timeline, Holly was like, I have the perfect photo to bring this to life, which is this one here of an excise man. So typically back in the day, distilleries used to have excise men that were living on site what this pitch is showing or depicting is the excise men locking up the spirit safe, which is where the spirit runs through when it comes off of the still, which you'll be seeing a close up of in a couple of slides time. But they used to live on site and they used to monitor every single drop of whiskey that came out of the stills in order to be able to pay, um, sorry, in order to be able to charge the distillery taxation for it. And that's really defined our past. That being said, I kind of want to focus instead of looking at sort of all of the nitty gritty of taxation on two big movements that really sort of like defined and changed the way, um, changed the reputation of Scotch within the world whiskey landscape. The growth and reputation of Scotch whiskey world worldwide can really be defined, I believe, by two really big important moments within history. And the first one was the creation of the continuous still, or coffee still. Um, originally, this was created by a gentleman called Aeneas Coffee, who was um, an excise man. And he created this still while he was in Ireland, um, a, 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 a still set up that would enable distillers to make much more whiskey, much quicker and much more cheaply, <laughs> or cheaper, I should say. And he took this to the Irish and he said, hey guys, do you want this? And they said, God, no, that's not real whiskey. That's blasphemous. And they took it to the Scots and Scots being thrifty, he said, well, you know, I've got this still set up that can help you make a lot more whiskey quicker and cheaper. And they were like, absolutely bring it on. And so that really led to um, the, the beginning of the of grain distilling in Scotland, which Holly is going to talk about later very briefly, which is really cool. But in line with that, we also then saw um, a rise of the whiskey barons or blenders. So it was in 1853, I believe, when the Gladstone law came into place, which um, made it legal for people to blend together grain whiskey and malt whiskey within a warehouse and to sell it onwards. And so you had these pioneering gentlemen, such as John Dewar, such as Johnny Walker, such as Andrew Usher, 
who realized that they could then create a whiskey that was consistent in flavor and consistent in quality. And they could use to their advantage this very, very sort of quickly, cheaply made grain whiskey and decorate it with the single malts of the day to create a whiskey that was theirs and then grow it overseas. And so really these two defining points within Scotch whiskey history kind of made Scotch go like this and rise up and up across, above the other sort of big five, as it were. And I think since then, we've had a roller coaster of going back and forward between like popularity between the big five whiskies and also between single malts and blends as well, which we're going to come into very shortly. So that's a really interesting piece I find anyway. Now, fast forward to today, um, and I mentioned before that whiskey in terms of history has really been defined by taxation and law. And we're very lucky today within Scotland to have the Scotch Whiskey Association. And the Scotch Whiskey Association are a governing body for the protection and regulation of Scotch whiskey. Um, now, a lot of people might think that, oh, well, they're quite strict and there's laws surrounding what we can and can't do within Scotland. But actually, the brilliant thing about having the Scotch Whiskey Association and in turn the Scotch Whiskey Regulations, which is the laws that they put out defining how we can make whiskey and the laws in which we need to abide by, it means that whenever you pick up a bottle of scotch, you know exactly what's going to be in the bottle and you know exactly the, the quality of whiskey that's going to be in there. You know that literally it is what it said it is on the bottle. Okay? And so I think we're very lucky to have that because if you look at other whiskey categories out there and, and a hot one that we've all been talking about recently is Japanese whiskey, which tastes delicious, but there's very loose regulations. You don't always know if your whiskey in your bottle is Japanese or not, but with Scotch, you definitely know what's in there. And some of these regulations that they've put out in the past have been you know, for instance, it must be aged for a minimum of three years in oak casks. And that's there to protect the flavor and the consistency of flavor in your whiskey. It must be made from only grain, water and yeast, nothing else. It must be made and matured in Scotland. And in the case of single malt, they must also be bottled in Scotland and it must be labeled appropriately. Now, they'll refresh these laws every once in a while and it was actually recently, last year, that they refreshed these laws um, to increase the flexibility that distillers can have on a whiskey. And so when it comes to maturation, we still need to use oak casks. But typically in the past, we would use mm, most of the time whiskeys coming from, sorry, casks coming from either the bourbon industry or the sherry industry. We can now use a much wider variety of casks coming from previous uses, um, such as agave spirits, calvados, barrel-aged cachaca, um, soju and baiju. And this has led birth to a multitude of new innovations that have come out. And this is almost our first whiskey pit stop, as it were, um, with Dewar's um, Illegal Smooth, which when these regulations were passed in 2019, this was the first ever whiskey to be launched that was finished in a mezcal cask which I think is really exciting it's a defining moment for scotch and it gives it kind of gave scott Jewers or Jewers gave scotch the ability to bring together two cultures into one the culture of mezcal and the culture of scotch whiskey um, now this is great for everyone in the U.S. because it's available in North America unfortunately I don't have it here but Holly does. So Holly, I mean, I've read the Dewar's Illegal Smooth. It's got these really lovely notes of almost like a green pepper note to it. Um, but what do you get in, in this whiskey? Yes. So uh, amazing packaging as well. And obviously we were, uh, it was highly anticipated. Uh, mezcal being a very uh, hot category right now as well. And a lot of people think um, about mezcal being smoky. And if you've had Illegal, it's actually, it's not smoky. It's very fruity and floral and almost a little funk on the end. Um, and you really get that. You get that nutty, uh, creamy fruit quality that Dewar's naturally is. But you get this very floral, um, delicate, almost ethereal quality on the finish too. So 
I'm excited to, to enjoy my first whiskey. Sorry, Georgie, that it's just here in the States. So. Yeah, we might need to do a transatlantic bottle swap. I think we can manage that. <laughs> yes, very bright on the finish, some citrus. Uh, I think it's a pleasant surprise, especially for the summertime months that uh, some of us are going through right now. It's, it's great for the summer as well. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to trying it properly. But um, so I think, you know, Dewar's doing that is great. As I said, there have been other new releases across other Scotch whiskies that have taken advantage of these new laws. Um, so I think going forward, we're going to see a lot more of this and a lot more um, less traditional casks being used to mature a Scotch, which again is going to open up a whole new avenue into the flavor of whiskey, of Scotch whiskey and what we can get from it. So now diving into the world of Scotch, I mentioned before about the Scotch Whiskey Association controlling the labeling around whiskey. And I think when you look at Scotch, there are five big subcategories that we look at um, that really define what the whiskey can be, what it can't be in turn, um, and what's inside the bottle. So to start with the most obvious two, well, to start with the most common two that you'll find, you've got your single malt Scotch whiskey and blended Scotch whiskey. So a single malt Scotch whiskey, as the name suggests, is from one single distillery. And we have about 130 odd distilleries in Scotland right now. Um, so that's 130 different single distilleries out there that could in essence make a single malt. And malt, as the name suggests, means that it has to be made just from malted barley alone. Um, and it has been made, matured and bottled in Scotland. And something I always like to add here is that a single malt isn't a single cask, okay? So a single malt whiskey is from one single distillery, but it's a marriage of casks from that one single distillery. Um, that's then bottled. And a great example of that is Aberfeldy 12 that we'll be tasting very shortly. Um, the other main category of scotch that you'll come across is blended whiskey. So a blended whiskey is made by combining single malt whiskies and single grain whiskies together. And this must be made and matured in Scotland. Um, so a great example of this is Dewar's. So the Dewar's Illegal Smooth that you just had is a great example of a blended Scotch whiskey. Um, you've got Johnny Walker, Chivas Regal, all of the big names. And um, I believe the top 10 selling whiskies in the world are all blend, Scotch whiskies are all blended Scotch whiskies. Um, so they really are the ones that rule the roost. About 93% of the world whiskey, of the Scotch whiskey market is blended Scotch whiskey. And the rest is, is made up predominantly of single malts. Um, and if you look back historically within whiskey, it was blends that, that sort of really ruled the way up until probably the 1960s when single malts started to get a look in properly. Um, so I would love, I think it's about time for a whiskey and this time I can actually have it as well, which is great. Holly, have you got yours to hand too? Aberfeldy, right? Yes. So Aberfeldy is a single malt Scotch whiskey, as I said before. So recap again, single from one single distillery. Malt means that it has to be made from malted barley. Aberfeldy as a distillery is from the Highlands. Um, it's just outside of Perthshire. So when we can all jump on a plane again and you can visit Scotland, um, Aberfeldy is about a 90 minute drive from Edinburgh. Um, and the whiskey itself has been aged for 12 years minimum. So that number on the front of the bottle is the minimum age of whiskey inside the bottle. Um, and this whiskey itself has been matured across four different cask types. So I mentioned before that a single malt is a marriage of cask types, a marriage of casks, sorry. And Aberfeldy 12 itself is a marriage of whiskies that have been matured in um, first fill, bourbon casks, first fill sherry casks, refill, and rechar. And each one of these different cask types will deliver a different flavor that comes through on the whiskey. So um, if you bring the whiskey up to your nose and give it a smell, always keep your mouth open while you're smelling because it creates a circulation um, and it means you're able to get more from the glass. 
But those first fill bourbon casks are giving you that lovely vanilla toffee fudge note. The first fill sherry casks are giving you that element of fruitcake. Uh, refill gives you that lovely floralness in the whiskey. And then the rechar casks, these are casks that have been used a couple of times in the whiskey industry. They get a little bit tired, so we're able to rechar them and it gives them a new lease of life. They bring a lovely spiciness into it. And then underneath all of those flavor notes, you have the distillery character. And Aberfeldy Distillery itself is known for creating a honeyed style of whiskey. So you definitely pick that up on the nose. And then, well, I have to have a sip to know what it's all about. You get that lovely depth and complexity. It's a very smooth, easygoing single malt. One that's good for any time of day. Well, after, you know, breakfast, after midday, of course. Although it's always midday somewhere. Um, and it's great neat, but I also really enjoy it in a cocktail as well. Um, it's great stirred down in an old fashioned, very easy drink to make at home. And to bring out those honeyed notes within Aberfeldy, you can replace the sugar syrup for honey syrup which is a nice little twist that anyone can do. Diving back in with our um, five single malt categories, or sorry, five whiskey categories, um, we then have our others. So we've already covered single malt whiskeys, and we've covered blended whiskey. We then have a single grain Scotch whiskey. So again, as the name suggests, this is from one single distillery, but this time it's from a grain distillery. So from one of those continuous stills that we saw at the very beginning, there's only about seven grain distilleries in Scotland at the moment. Um, and this will be made from a mixture of grain. So typically either wheat or maize, potentially maybe rye and a little bit of barley. Um, and a great example of that is Loch Lomond, which is the picture here. Um, they do their own. North British, you can also find as well. The next, the fourth, subcategory that you can find is a blended malt scotch whiskey. So this is a blend of whiskies that have just come from malt whiskey distilleries. So our single malt distilleries coming into one. Um, and these are just made from malted barley. Um, a great example of this is Compass Box Peat Monster and Johnny Walker Green Label and Monkey Shoulder. They're all examples of blended malt scotch whiskies. And then the fifth one is a blended grain scotch whiskey. So this is whiskies from multiple grain distilleries married together, um, typically made from a mixture of grains. So typically wheat, maize and barley again, and maybe some rye in there too. And a really great example of that is Compass Box Hedonism. This was, I, I mean, this was Compass Box's first whiskey that they ever bought out in, I believe it was the year 2000, um, and which was revelational. Blended grain scotch whiskey is such a um, unique niche category within whiskey. You don't see a lot of them out there. Um, so this was really defining. It's a really unusual thing within the whiskey world. Um, and typically going back 100 years, this sort of whiskey would be more common, but definitely not today. So one of the things I love about Compass Box is the way that their fight for transparency and the fact that you can see here, this information of what's inside a bottle of Compass Box Hedonism is available for anyone to download through their website. So you can see the five different components of whiskies that have gone into making Compass Box Hedonism, what distilleries they've come from, the proportion and the type of cast that they've come from. So um, you can really get an idea as to the flavor of the whiskey inside the bottle. And typically Compass Box Hedonism, you're looking at quite a light style of whiskey, a very floral um, and a great whiskey that you can put in a highball. So with that in mind, I think we're gonna jump straight into production and I'm gonna hand over to Holly to lead this section. Thanks Georgie. And completely agree, Compass Box is a, a great uh, company and brand to explore and watch if you're looking for some of those subcategories, those smaller categories that we typically don't see. Um, so everything but the single malts and the, the blended scotch whiskey. So a great one to, to tap into if you're looking to explore the more esoteric. So I, uh, 
I don't want Georgie to get upset with me, so I've got just a little bit of time for production, um, but we'll be able to cruise through rather quickly. Um, she knows that I can go down rabbit holes rather quickly, so um, I guess with no questions right now, it's not, uh, we're not going to be able to go down a rabbit hole. So um, we're going to go through a, quite a few production slides, and they'll be quite heavy, but they're actually, it's quite a simple process, so um, we should be able to cruise through pretty well. So first is really what everyone talks about is how simple a process it really is to make Scotch whiskey. And of course, we are focusing still on, on Scotland. It's Scotch 101. So every country will have um, its different ingredients and different rules and regulations like Georgie had mentioned. And to start, we'll actually focus on malt whiskey. And we will eventually cover more of that blended grain style as well. So these are really the three main ingredients, although there's a few extra that we must not forget on the next slide. Um, but these are the three main ingredients that you need. You need water and you need a lot of it. Um, historically and true to this day, you need a lot of quality water. You need that just for processes in the distillery. Um, you need to be able to cool down hot liquids that you have at the distillery, be able to clean all the equipment. And then of course, just water for actual production, for uh, proofing down when putting into casks and into bottles. We need grain and we need a lot of that too. So again, we're gonna focus on barley to start, but uh, lots of different grains being utilized in Scotland. And then yeast. Uh, we leave this one be a little bit in Scotland. Uh, we know that distiller's yeast is tried and true in the Scotch whiskey industry for lots of those different products that we produce. So it can come in different dry, slurry, cream yeast, but uh, typically most Scotch whiskey distilleries will use what we call distiller's yeast. So those are the three uh, main ingredients that we're looking at, but also the, the extra magic as we have here, and these must not be forgotten. And these are actually um, some of these key flavor building blocks. So building blocks of flavor. And as we go through some of these slides, uh, Georgie and I have highlighted maybe where to really focus our attention and energy of, you know, ding, ding, ding. These are very important uh, key places where a distillery manager or a blender or who's ever running these distilleries has a choice to impart and impact the flavor of the whiskey. So human hand involvement. Uh, you see right here, this lovely Scottish gentleman is looking in that, uh, that spirit safe and he's making a decision on cut points. So there's lots of points in the process, whether it's grain choice, uh, how to malt and dry that grain, fermentation, type of yeast, length of fermentation, cut points, cask choices, those little pieces of the puzzle all start to add up and those are all human induced. Um, cask influence as well. So not only just what casks are you choosing to fill, um, fill uh, you know, different varietals and different types of, of wine casks or ex-bourbon casks, but also the blender has that decision to how to marry these casks together. So of course, every distillery and blender will have a different decision for that. And then time. We have a lovely 40-year-old Aberfeldy uh, pictured here. That is a long time. Took a lot of patience to wait for that. Of course, minimum age is three years required in oak. But we have those decisions of how long do we want certain casks to age and when do we feel they are ready to be bottled. So these must not be forgotten. So lots of little pieces to those three main ingredients. And this is a bit of a heavy slide, so we won't stay on it too long, but it's a quick linear overview of what we'll be focusing in for each step of the process. So uh, you have your barley here. Um, and so we're obviously going to need to somehow gain access to some of the, the starch and sugar that's already in that grain. Uh, we're going to move it into mashing, which will be adding additional hot water. That's where we can finally have access to the sugar and utilize yeast for our fermentation. This is where we finally have alcohol. This is step one of alcohol. Uh, typically a double distillation in those iconic pot stills for malt whiskey in Scotland, but we do sometimes triple distill, um, although typically that's assumed for Ireland, but it's not just for Ireland. And maturation, so then taking that um, that new make spirit or that, uh, that clear new make spirit that eventually will become whiskey with time and casks um, and maturing that for how, how long we see fit. So let's dive in here and get into malting. 
So malting, I like to start out a lot uh, of times with malting and comparing it to, to wine and, and ferment it or, and uh, different sorts of other distilled products. Uh, it makes a little bit more sense in my mind when I think about when I go out to a vineyard and I grab a grape off of the vine, right? And I pop that grape in my mouth and it's sweet, right? It's nice. It's fruit. It's sweet. So I know there's sugar in it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and we know that naturally yeast will eat sugar and a byproduct of that process, um, we can create alcohol along with lots of other things. So with grains, it's, we have to take an extra step, right? There's a little bit more we have to do. If you went into a barley field in Scotland and popped a, a seed into your mouth, you might chip your tooth and you would probably not taste anything sweet. So we have access to starch with that barley seed so how do we as humans, because it's tried and true, the, the test of time, how do we make alcohol out of things that we have left over from agriculture? And so uh, you have to do these extra steps called malting. So we're going to take those seeds and steep them in hot water for a few days, raise the moisture content, then lay it out. Uh, typically in the old days would be on a floor, but we basically just need to let it start to germinate or grow. We want this now damp seed to think that it's in the ground in a safe place and going to sprout a, a new stalk and grow a new seed. Because what's happening is that process of it wanting to grow will actually convert those starches into simple sugars. It's the first step of the process. But then we actually don't want that stalk to grow because we want access to the sugars for ourselves to make alcohol. So we quickly need to dry out that grain. And so this is the kilning process and this is a very key point. And you'll see now on this next slide for kilning, we have that beautiful, lovely uh, snifter glass in the top right, and really making a note to, to drive home that this is a building block of flavor, is this kilning process. And I'll, uh, I know Georgie adores those pagodas that are in that uh, left-hand photo. So I'll let her, her talk about her beloved pagodas for a minute. Everyone's like, oh. Georgie and her pagodas. Yes. Um, so these pagodas are also known as the Doig ventilators and they're, um, Charles Doig was a um, architect who back in the 1890s transformed the way that we malted barley for good because he created this Doig ventilator or this chimney through which it was on top of a kiln and it meant that um, as if you had that chimney in place with your air vents at the top if you were malting or kilning your barley underneath, as the smoke was going through the kiln and through the barley, instead of being trapped in that building, it was able to escape. And Charles Doig had a role to play in building over 50 distilleries across Scotland. He was absolutely instrumental um, in the uh, boom within Speyside that happened in the 1890s. He built a couple of our distilleries. He built Aberfeldy, Craig Ellicke, Altmore. Um, and so this pagoda rooftop, yeah, changed the way that we malted barley for good. But not only that, it became a symbol of Scotch whiskey around the world. And these days, even though most distilleries don't malt their barley on site anymore, a lot of new distilleries are being built with this pagoda rooftop as a symbol of Scotch whiskey. Thanks, Georgie. They're basically the skyscrapers of the north of Scotland. <laughs> They're not that tall, but that's uh, what you see off in the distance. You know that whiskey is being produced out there. Um, so yes, the, and that process was to try and actually encourage less smoke um, to be imparted on the barley because what's happening during this kilning process is you have that damp grain and you're going to lay it out over a, a sieve floor and you need to now dry it. Um, so the, the style now that most people would use in Aberfeldy that we just drank is this way as well, would be unpeated as we call it. So they're just going to blow hot air. Think of your clothes tumbling in your, in your dryer, right? You're just going to tumble hot air, blow hot air on that damp grain and let it dry. Um, really retains that malty fruity quality that will naturally get out of the grain. Of course, no fruit is in the grain. Um, but uh, in Scotland, you have a pretty major fuel source that would have been uh, more accessible and easier to utilize um, in the past, and that would have been peat. And most of the coastal island regions, some in the highlands as well, have maintained this process. 
and you'll see the kiln in this photo, um, you'll take that peat or that turf um, and you'll actually do a slow burn and you'll get the smoke from that peat called the peat reek that will actually rise up and attach to the damp grain as it's drying. And that smoky flavor that's being imparted as it's drying carries all the way through the whole process of production, through mashing, through fermentation, distillation, and maturation. So it's quite an important building block of flavor. You can also utilize oil, which only Craigalachie um, utilizes this process anymore in Scotland. This will impart same concept as the peat, but will impart more of a burnt oily sort of quality. So very, very important building block of flavor here in this kilning process. So we will have our dried out uh, barley. It will have been malted. So we have a decent amount of sugar available to us, but we need some more. We definitely wanna be able to get more sugar out of that, that seed. So we're going to mill it down and then fill that milled barley, which we call grist, into this basically big uh, porridge vat, right? Think of your big bowl of porridge. Um, and we're going to continue to add hot waters. Typically in Scotland, we'll add three hot waters onto this grist um, and this milled down barley. And over multiple hours, we'll slowly rotate it. And what we're doing is that those hot waters will continue to convert even more of those starches that we didn't get during malting um, into sugars during this process. So uh, there's lots of different types of, of mash tons that you can utilize. Um, all of them somehow will agitate uh, the grain and the water to continue to, um, you know, continue to in encourage the, the barley to release and, and change with the enzymes some of those starches into sugars. This is also a building block of flavor because there's different ways that you can drain that sugary water away. Um, and so what we're doing, the bottom again is a sieve floor and we're able to drain that sugar water that we're creating in this environment away and eventually over to fermentation. Now, a lot of distilleries want what's called a clear wort. And so it'll be a very slow drain off because we don't want any of the grains. We want clear basically means nothing in it. Or you can have a cloudy wort, which is where you would actually take in some of the grains over into fermentation. And those will impart different flavors. Clear will typically be a little bit brighter where cloudy will, will be a little bit heavier when we're producing our beer and then moving along to distillation. So this is a, one of our uh, mash tons of Scotland here. And as we move along, we finally have made it to where we can make alcohol, right? So up to this point, we have not actually made any alcohol. We're just trying to get sugar um, to encourage that process. So we're going to pump that sugary water or wort over into the fermenters, so into the, the wash back room. Uh, this is actually one of the places where we'll have some heat exchange. It's very hot sugary water, this wort. So we'll have to cool it down. We'll pump it into these wash backs and every distillery has different sizes, um, you know, different layouts. Some will be large, um, pine, some are stainless steel. So everyone has their own choice of what type of vessel they want to use, but it's basically just a vessel to, to hold all of the sugary water and let fermentation do its thing and, and create a beer or wash as we call it. So once that sugary water has been filled into these wash backs, we're going to then basically pump in or dump in, depending on the distillery, that, that yeast. Um, and that yeast is going to go to work rather quickly on those sugars. So as we move into, into the next, um, next phase, you see we've, we're showing some of the yeast activity here. And this is again, the, the beer making or, or wash making process is a huge building block of flavor. And this has uh, garnered a lot of attention um, over really the past decade and how important the beer is to whiskey production. Um, sometimes it's been left out in the past. And so what's happening is that yeast will eat those sugars basically. It will metabolize those sugars and has a few byproducts. So by metabolizing those sugars, it will basically plop out alcohol, CO2, and heat. And so we of course want that alcohol and typically we'll get in Scotland around seven to 8% alcohol by volume. Um, so it is a beer, we're brewers up front, of course, no hops. So we have this beer, but everyone gets the decision of how long to let that yeast go to work. Um, and we're 
again, distiller's yeast, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, so we're, most of us are using the same yeast, but how long we let it linger in there is, is the, the flavor building block. So an average in Scotland would be around 50 to 60, 65 hours to let fermentation run. Um, that encourages really more of these fruity qualities. It can be shorter, which gives you a, a more, a heavier, more robust, nuttier style beer, or you can go very long. We just drank Aberfeldy, um, which is considered a long fermentation. And you probably tasted a lot of sweet notes um, in that Aberfeldy 12 year old. At Aberfeldy, our fermentations are at least 72 plus hours. So we're getting more of that sweet floral quality in, in the washback and encouraging that with a longer fermentation. So uh, now we have our beer, right? We have our beer around seven, eight percent ABV, and now we need to continue to adapt and, and change that alcohol um, to be able to get to a higher alcohol by volume. So these are the iconic pot stills that you'll see in Scotland. Of course, beautiful, you walk into the still house. You really only need two pot stills um, to, to have this process go forward. Here you'll see multiple pot stills, but they work in pairs. So you have a wash still and a spirit still. You can tell the wash still, which is going to receive the beer because it'll have sight glasses. So you can tell right away when you walk into the distillery, they want to be able to watch that beer bubbling over. And so we're going to pump that beer, that seven, eight percent alcohol by volume wash into the first uh, pot still. And here we're going to focus on those boiling points. So alcohol and ethanol will boil at a lower temperature and evaporate than water. So we're just separating that ethanol and alcohol away from the water to get a higher ABV. So we'll get around 30% alcohol by volume on the first run. That's called our low wines. We're going to capture that, pump that into the spirit still, where we'll do the same exact process. These are kettles, so boil them up. Um, and be able to capture a much broader and higher range of alcohol by volume. And this is another building block of flavor. So this spirit run, we're going to have cut points. We do not have it on that first distillation on the wash run. So we're going to have these cut points. We typically will call them, because I think it's nice and cute, but the heads, hearts, and tails, right? It makes sense to visualize a, a creature or an animal of sorts. Um, so depending on what type of characteristics you're trying to harness into your, into your bottle, you will take different cut points for that heart run. So you'll let the spirit run off the still for, for a bit to get more of those volatile light congeners off and away. Um, we'll collect those. And then each distillery will take a different ABV range. So here we've listed 70% alcohol by volume down to 63, maybe 60% alcohol by volume. And that little sliver of, of alcohol is what we want to capture, take away, and will eventually be put into casks. So that will vary between distilleries. And the higher you take into the higher alcohol by volume will be a brighter, more floral quality. The lower will be heavier and robust. The third, the tails run, will then be collected and distilled again as well, along with the heads. So this is a, another huge um, differentiator for the distilleries is this uh, hearts run. And you can have lots of different types of stills. Um, these are all encouraging different amounts of copper contact. Uh, these stills are obviously beautiful and iconic, but copper is so important to this process because copper will have reactions with that alcohol and ethanol to make it a little bit more delicate, floral, not as robust, strip some of those things out. So you can have really tall stills for a lot of copper contact. You can have shorter stills for a more robust spirit. There's lots of different styles of stills. So when you walk into that still house, when you see that you can really start to envision, okay, they're looking for a brighter style spirit. And then go taste that whiskey and it probably is living up to that. So these are just a few examples here. Um, and then we need to, uh, we must not forget condensers. So copper, we talk about how important it is for these reactions that we need with the spirit, but there is copper in our condensing systems. And a lot of times at distilleries, it will be kind of brushed over and we don't discuss it. But the, that copper contact in those condensing systems is just as important as a building block of flavor as the stills. And so there's two different types of condensers. We'll look at a zoomed in photo in a minute. 
Um, but the shell and tube condenser is the most common. Um, and the worm tub condensers are, there's only about 18 distilleries left that have this old, more of a rudimentary style of condensing system. So all we really need to know for this is that shell and tube condensers have meters and meters of all different sizes, but small copper tubes. Um, cold water is going to pass through and condense that hot vapor back into a liquid. And imagine it's about this size, it's the size of you know, the end of a bottle. So it could be that size copper tube. Worm tub condensers, which you see relative to that human in that photo, imagine you're giving a big bear hug to someone, right? They're huge. So if you imagine a hot vapor rushing into a copper surface area of the end of a bottle versus a big bear hug, right? It's much easier in person. You can see how big my bear hug is. But there's more aggressive copper contact in the shell and tube condensing system than there is in the worm tub condensing system. And that's why, Georgie, I think you have this one as well with you. But Kregalaki 13 is a prime example, also a prime number, a prime example of um, a worm tub utilizing, uh, or a distillery utilizing worm tubs. And it tends to be a much heavier, more robust, oily, um, maybe even meteor quality spirit. And that's because of the less copper contact with our worm tub condensers. So quickly touching on as well, we must not forget um, all of the other grains that we use and our continuous stills, as Georgie mentioned. So again, this is not batch style anymore. Now this is continuous. So these column stills are acting in the same way as those pot stills. Uh, obviously copper contact, boiling points, ethanol, ethanol, alcohol, and water capturing those vapors, but now we have different plates throughout the column. We can put the wash or the beer in the top of the column, hot steam rises up, and when they meet, we obviously have that boiling effect. Um, and so you can continuously feed um, this different types of grain whiskey into this column still. Uh, so just a different method of distillation, but obviously a bit more efficient um, and more copper contact than you would get in a pot still as well. So we'll, uh, we must talk about casks. So now we've left, uh, well, potentially not, but left the distillery and, and all of the equipment there. We have our, our new mix spirit, our clear new mix spirit right off of the stills. And we need to talk about maturation. So maturation, a lot of times we think, okay, we fill the whiskey into the cask and it's adding things to that, that soon to be whiskey. But actually, there are multiple things happening. Actually, more than multiple. There's a lot of things happening during maturation. It's not just additive. It's also subtractive. It's also that cask and that oak is removing things uh, from that spirit that maybe are less desired um, than others. And also, there's many different um, organic chemical reactions happening as well within maturation. So of course, we'll get input from whatever spirit was already in those oak casks. Um, which we'll talk about some different varieties of casts that we can, can play with and utilize. And we're also getting input from the different types of oak. There's different types of oak around the world. And we're also then having that cask work through the spirit to be able to strip out potentially some uh, flavors we, we might not want in our bottle. This here show, is a great example of, there's so many different types of casks that you can utilize for maturation of Scotch whiskey, but as we, as we know from the Illegal Smooth and the Mezcal cask, there's many more uh, out, coming out and about. So uh, you can go down as small as 40 liters. The largest you can do um, is up to a, a Gorda 700 liters. The ones circled are gonna be your, your classic, your staples. So your bourbon barrel at 200 liters, your hogshead, which is a remade cast to be slightly larger at 250 liters, and your sherry butt at 500 liters. So these are gonna be your, your staples of the Scotch whiskey industry, and really up to at least 70% of flavor profile of what we drink out of that bottle is coming from our cast choices and from those oak casts. So of course, very, very important um, to get good quality casts. And here is a, a, a nice diagram showing all the different flavors you might be able to achieve from different types of casks. And I want to tap into Georgie as well. I know she loves her wine too. Um, I'd love to hear Georgie's thoughts on some wine cask finishes uh, that I know we've chosen for, for this uh, seminar and any of her thoughts on some of these cool finishing casks. 
Yeah, and a word on finishing. I mean, finishing is such an exciting thing for us within whiskey and maturation. Um, what it essentially means when you break it down is a whiskey has been matured for the majority of its life in one type of cask, typically ex-bourbon, and then it's finished for six months, a year, two years, in a different type of cask that will give a complementary flavour to the overall whiskey. I like to think of it like putting a layer of icing on a cake. That's kind of what finishing is, but in the whiskey terms. And who doesn't like cake, right? So you can see on this page four different types of um, finished whiskies. Um, and actually one of my first whiskies, it was my aha whiskey, which was Glenmorangie Quinta Ruben, which is um, Glenmorangie, where you saw those big tall stills. They say they have stills the same height as an average male giraffe. Um, that's a fact you do not forget. And this one is finished in a port cask. So that's why it's got those lovely, almost red currant notes that come through. Royal Brackler 12, the whole Royal Brackler range is finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks. You've then got Long Row Red. Um, I love Long Row, Holly. I know you adore Long Row. Uh, Long Row Red is always finished each year. They choose a different red wine cask to finish their whiskey in. And then Kilcoman, one of the newest newest is there's newer ones now i always say newest but it's maybe not so new uh one of the newer distilleries on isla and kilcoman is this one has been finished in a sotan cask so those be that beautiful sweet white wine and this has this lovely buttery butteriness to it that i really enjoy holly you said you've got two of the long way reds to hand which i'm very jealous about yes i've got a, a melbeck and a cabernet so I'm not sure which one I'll, uh, one's cracked, so <laughs> we will start with the mail back. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think within the world of whiskey, as Holly was saying, there's so many different flavors that you can explore. Up to 70% of the final flavor of a whiskey comes from the wood that it's been matured in. Um, that That's when you use a first fill. Obviously, we, we use casks. Again, casks are like tea bags so you can use them again and again and different flavors come from them um so i just think i really like that slide before with all the flavors coming from the cask because it shows that whiskey isn't just whiskey it's one dimensional holly what's your favorite finished scotch out there oh geez right on the spot okay <laughs> i think um i i do love a good port cask and they're few and far between right there uh and there's different types of port and uh, you can get really grassy ones, um, and you can get really fruit bomb ones. Um, I, I really love some port casks. There's a Tomatin port cask that, that I adore. So I think I'm a sucker for port, but they're few and far between. So we'll go with port for today. Okay. That message came across loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With a little bit of time that we have left, um, I want to go into the future of Scotch because we've kind of done the past, where we've come from where we are today, which is how whiskey is made. And now we're looking at the future. And these are just some future predictions that we're seeing, that they're almost like themes that we're seeing popping up more and more within the world of Scotch whiskey. Really exciting themes that you should be aware of and that also dictate the flavor of whiskey and what you get in your glass. Um, and some of them we've already seen a little bit, but I just want to re-emphasize on them. So. The first future prediction is all around production. Um, and two that pop up actually are inspired by what's going on within the Irish whiskey scene. Um, the relationship between Scotland and Ireland in history is so interesting. You know, as we've had our pitfalls, they've had their raises, rises. And then if we, we've seen our rises in Scotch, they've seen pitfalls as well. We're kind of like seesawing. And I believe now we're into sort of the, the new golden age of Irish whiskey. And one thing that they're looking at, there's a new distillery there called Waterford, who are really dialing into terroir. They have a, um, a code on the back of each bottle sold, which gives you in, gets you into a web portal where you can like listen to a soundscape from the barley field of where the barley was grown and learn about the soil types from your barley and all sorts. And 10, 15 years ago, when we talked about terroir and whiskey, it was kind of like, it just wasn't looked upon at all. And I think it's definitely a topic within Scotch that we're going to see a little bit more in, um, having been inspired by other whiskey categories. The other little um, 
production prediction is around yeast varietals. Holly, you mentioned that the two main ones we use are um, ex brewer's yeast and distiller's yeast. And obviously these yeast types gives us, give us consistency in flavor. You know, if you change up your yeast type, then you really can change the flavor of your whiskey. And I think fermentation as an area within production is often overlooked, but it's really during fermentation where you're creating flavor and it's in distillation that you're refining this flavor. And what you see here on the screen is a picture of, of wild yeast from, um, from grapes. And Glenmorangie did one recently, Glenmorangie Alta. They used um, a propagated wild yeast they found from the barley fields. Um, within Teeling, Irish whiskey again, they use, along with distillers yeast, they use um, an, an, a South African white wine yeast. And all of that is going to dictate, dictate the flavor that's being created during the fermentation stage. So I feel that we're going to be seeing in the future within Scotch a variation within yeast types. And we're going to see really cool, interesting new yeasts being used, probably on sort of a smaller scale. Because remember with Scotch, what we're making literally right now, we're not going to drink in 12 years time. So um, mistakes can be quite expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think we're going to see a lot more experimentation within yeast varietals and the flavors of the whiskies that are coming from them. The second prediction is around transparency. And we touched on this before. In 2016, um, Compass Box led a transparency um, campaign to highlight the need for transparency as to what's inside the bottle. And I think as the whiskey audience is becoming ever curious about what's inside a bottle and wanting to know more. We as distillers will be giving out more and more information. So I think, you know, I, I always say we're living in the golden age of drinking whiskey. Um, and I believe that with transparency, being able to learn more what's inside the bottle is really going to help us with that and our knowledge. And then my third big prediction, which we're seeing a bit of now, um, but I've fingers crossed will long live or live long is the democratization of scotch um, for a very long time. Um, and it's kind of been increasing and it's been seen as like a competition. Scotch whiskey, especially single malts, are put on a pe pedestal and the prices of them are, are skyrocketing. And as a result, something that was literally made for the everyday person is now, unfortunately, in some cases, only being sold to a select few. There are two things I want to highlight on here. One of them is what we did with Craig Ellicke 51. So we had one cask of Craig Ellicke 51 distilled in December of 1962. And instead of putting it in a crystal decanter and um, giving it to or selling it to a select few, because we only had 51 bottles of it, we instead gave it away for free, dram by dram across the world. And it meant that over 1,500 people got to try this whiskey. So it was really sort of creating the world's most uncollectible collectible whiskey, but also just bringing Scotch whiskey back to what it's all about. And I think the reason that both Holly and I are in the whiskey game, which is the fact that it's really there to be enjoyed and drunk with friends old and new. And the whole ritual around whiskey is the ability to clink glasses and that connection point over a whiskey, whether in real life or these days a bit more digitally. And the other one is um, the Break Even Bottle, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, started up by Bobby Hugel from Bar Anvil in Houston, in Texas. Um, and the Break Even Bottle is about taking a bottle of scotch or whatever whiskey you have, um, dividing the cost, cost price into 27 and then selling that whiskey by the dram um, at cost price. So it means that you really are able to share these really rare whiskeys and put them at an affordable price. So he calls it drunken socialism, which I really like. And it's almost like a, a whiskey handshake, thank you, from the bar to the customer. If anyone wants to know more, let me know or hit up Bobby. Um, but I'd love to see more of the break even bottle happen around the world. And then finally, I just want to touch on cocktails and Normally within Scotch one-on-ones, we focus a lot on cocktails and what you can do, what you can't do. Cocktails are a huge avenue for Scotch. Don't shy away from them. 
don't shy away from putting a single malt in cocktails as well. Um, the way I like to think about it is that chefs like to use their finest ingredients in dishes. So why shouldn't bartenders use their finest ingredients in cocktails as long as they're used appropriately? And what I mean by that is um, uh, Craig Ellicky 31 won World's Best Whiskey a couple of years ago. Tastes great neat. It would probably taste delicious in a frozen pina colada, but it probably wouldn't be the most appropriate use of that whiskey in a cocktail. Um, that being said, I'm a huge fan of a highball. That's what's pictured here. Um, highballs are super simple. Anyone can make them at home. Scotch whiskey and soda. Scotch whiskey and coconut water goes really well. Green tea. I'm a huge fan as well of um, scotch whiskey, honey syrup and chilled chamomile tea as well. Those flavors go really well together. But basically experiment with scotch. Don't shy away from that category on your back bar. Um, and I'm sure you can make something absolutely delicious with it. And if you ever need a recipe taster, Holly and I are here for you to help with that. Honestly, we will, we'll do that for you. We'll, we'll, we'll try your cocktails. Um, I like recipe, but recipe taster is even better. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, I feel like we've gone through like a, a whirlwind of scotch, mm -hmm. past, present and future. Um, if you have any questions, please hit us up, let us know any thoughts, any comments, any Scotch recipes that need to be tasted. Um, but I'd love to raise my glass to all of you, um, to Holly as well. Thank you, Holly. Cheers, Georgie. Um, and to the team at Tales for bringing this year's Tales seminars virtually and continuing the spirit of education with Tales and the camaraderie of it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone at the Erin Rose for a drink next year. So cheers, thank you. Thanks Georgie, thanks Tails. <laughs>